So for, for those of you that weren't here with the first session, if you don't know me already, I'm Dr. Selena Lucas, and I've been in practice about 33 years now, a little over 33. Uh, love ER, urgent care, GP, and I am what I would call an open-minded skeptic. When I was uh, first in practice in San Diego, I had uh, a lovely woman, 90 years, 90 years old, who had a wiener dog, two years old, with six calcified discs on her x-ray and completely down in the back. She did have deep pain, so there was some hope, right? But she could not afford to go to a surgeon and get her back cut. So we used steroids, we used methocarbamol, we used passive range of motion, and she actually let us hospitalize this dog um, for two weeks. So cage rest, enforced cage rest for two weeks. After two weeks, this little one could not she could wag her tail, but she could not get that rump off the ground. And um, we set up a euthanasia appointment. So she comes, and her 70-year-old son comes. It's the three of us, and we're all crying, and the dog is just so happy to see her mom. And I told her that, um, I said, you know what? I don't know about this acupuncture stuff, <laughs> but I've heard it could help with something like this. Do you want to try it? And she did. She did want to try it because it was a lot more affordable. So um, she saw one of my colleagues at the practice, Kevin May, who used to be the president of the International Veterinary Acupuncture Society, but I didn't know that, and I worked with the man because he was that humble. He was our equine guy. He would come in and see dogs and cats on Thursdays, and I just, and he, you know, he had his belt buckle, everything. <laughs> Good old boy from Texas. So I just thought, well, that's Kevin's stuff. But I sent this dog to him. He did the first treatment and nothing happened. He did the second treatment and she stood up. So it's not placebo effect in a wiener dog, right? They don't know why you're putting all those needles in them. That's to say that every time I come up against one of these new tools that, I st that I'm using now or refer, like I don't know how to do chiropractic, but I definitely refer that and I see big changes and then my acupuncture is stronger after that um, on those animals. Uh, then it was Chinese herbs and then it was some homeopathy and then um, nutritional supplements like standard process. Is anybody using standard process here? You already have a book. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, that's a really cool thing. Um, one of my kitties who lived to be 23 years old uh, naturally started having kidney failure at age 18, would not eat KD, and I got him started on standard process uh, feline renal support, and it's just targeted nutrition for whatever organ you're working with. Also, they make a great one for cardiac, which is also great for cats with, hemor with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, yes. Is that brand? But yeah, Standard Process is the company that makes the supplement. Uh, anyway, yeah, they make thyroid, they have immune, they have all kinds of things. We use that as an adjunct to a lot of these things. But um, his, he uh, started seizuring when he was 23, and I was sure it was his kidney shutting down. You know, I'd check them every year. And they were stable, but I was sure, okay, well, now that's done. But they were. His BUM was 40 and his creatinine was like 1.6 at 23. It was a brain tumor <laughs> um, that I lost him to. So I'm telling you this because I want to make the point that you don't have to be a holistic veterinarian <laughs> to start to use some of these things. I don't have formal training except for acupuncture. I don't have formal training in any of this, but you can go to conferences, work with other veterinarians that are using it, and start to understand how you can apply it, and it helps so many other things that otherwise we're just up against a, we can't, we can't get in there soon enough, like with the, the supplements, that makes a big difference, um, or, and with the ozone too. So. Um, let me get into some methods of application. How do you use this stuff? Once you generate it, uh, because w as we talked about earlier, it's an unstable gas, so you have to generate it on the spot, and then how are we going to use it? So you can use ozonated water. Like I was saying, when we do dentals, you can put it right into your dental machine so that the entire procedure, you're using distilled water that's been previously ozonated, and you're killing uh, bacteria in the mouth and also reducing inflammation. Uh, we talked about how on the human side, a lot of uh, periodontal dentists are using it uh, also for sensitive teeth. Um, 
You can use ozonated eardrops. We like to flush our nasty ears with epiotic first, do a good flush, and then we'll come behind that with ozonated saline and really get the, the inflammation out, but also kill any resistant pathogens because pseudomonas. Um, you can give it in sub Q fluids. We do that for all of our sick old kitties. Cats hate cold sub Q fluids. You guys probably know this. I love to run my IV tubing through a mason jar of hot water or some kind of little container of hot water before it gets to the kitty. And it's so much easier on them. And it's a big practice tip for people at home, too, because their cats hate it. But if it's a nice warm bath uh, under the skin, it's much more um, enjoyable. Uh, ozone becomes even more unstable at warmer temperatures. So when we use ozone in our sub-Q fluids, we inject it into the line. We don't ozonate our saline first and then give it, because then it has to be cold. So if we give it right as it, in the port, right as it goes into the body, then we get both. We get a nice warm uh, sub-Q fluid, but we can ozonate it too. The body will absorb that ozone through the sub-Q um, blood vessels just like it does anywhere else. But you don't get the rapid uh, systemic effect like you do with the rectal that we're going to talk about, or the IV. Um, you can do, it says spinal ozone injections. They're using ozone uh, in the paralumbar space for people with herniated discs. And I use it in my acupuncture points for back pain. It just augments what I'm doing because we're delivering more oxygen to an area that's already compromised and spasming. Um, Maybe, do you guys, anybody know what dry needling is for athletes? Yeah? You've already got a book. <laughs> so for, the, for a few people who are just new joining us, I have a couple of books. If people can answer questions for me, you get a free book. So just so you know. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's got a lot of protocols and uh, different ways of applying ozone in veterinary practice. Uh, we give it rectally. You can give it vaginally. Um, if you've got a pile you've just taken care of, you can flush that, that, uh, that vaginal chamber and get rid of uh, excess there. I also use it on the stump. I will clean the, the stump uh, so I don't get a stump pile before I put that back in the abdomen. Um, subcutaneous gas injections. That's when I usually will use this around a a skin tumor that we're not taking off. I, if I can cut something off, that's usually what I want to do. But some of these animals are too sick or too old, and if I don't feel like um, I want to use a local to get it off, uh, we have a dog, an old golden retriever that's coming in. He's got a very hard two centimeter, almost three centimeter mass on the side of his hock that I can't even get a needle biopsy on because it's so stiff. That's usually a bad sign. <laughs> um, so we're doing ozone around that and he's getting rectal and it's soft and it's disappearing. So that's, uh, that's another way it's used. Um, topical oils, we use it on hot spots, we use it on uh, insect bites, I'll use it on mast cell tumors until we can get it off or treat it some other way. Um, exposed tumors or open wounds, we talked about that. You're, you're killing pathogens and you're oxygenating, reducing inflammation, so it's a win-win-win for those kinds of areas. Uh, bagging is a way of getting ozone around a whole part of the body. You can actually put a small critter actually in a plastic bag and do their whole body. Somebody stopped by the booth yesterday and was asking me about it. Their, her dog, who has terrible uh, yeast dermatitis, malassezia dermatitis, and you can actually bag the whole critter. Anybody have a thought why that, that, that could be a problem, though, from the first lecture? What are one of the, what's one thing you never want to do with ozone? Inhale, Inhale it. Right. <laughs> you don't have one yet, do you? OK. <laughs> there you go, Nicole. So when we do bagging, whether it's a leg or an entire critter, we do it outside so that any gas that leaks, and you want to make sure that's nice and snug, so you put vet wrap around and make it snug um, so that you don't get gas leaking out of that area, whether it's a leg or a body. Um, and then MAHT, MHT, major hemotherapy, is when you use the patient's blood 
and mix it with ozone and saline and then give it back intravenously. That's major. Minor is taking a little bit of the patient's blood, mixing it with ozone gas, shaking it up in your syringe, and then injecting it. You can inject around tumors. You can uh, inject it sub-Q or I IM to help with allergies, which I will show my dog Zoe in a minute for that. So that, let's get to some actual cases here. So a bunch of these slides are um, courtesy of Dr. Siegel in Florida. She has probably, it's like the blue pearl of holistic medicine, <laughs> all right? She has every known therapy known to veterinary medicine, and she uses the heck out of ozone. So a lot of these slides are from her. Um, so this is um, just showing how you, you can drain uh, with a, we usually want to go for a jugular to collect the blood sample first, and then we're going to mix it in a very particular bag. Uh, it almost looks like a transfusion bag so that you can mix it with your ozone and saline and then give it back. Um, so as you guys all know, it's better to draw from a jug, especially if you've got a bigger sample. So they're just showing that here. Um, that's the, the minor, right? Because it's in a syringe going around a tumor. This is a boxer, if I remember right. Um, I don't remember what kind of mass this was, but she was injecting the dog's blood mixed with ozone around that area and it resolved. The rectal insufflation that we talked about a little bit in the first session. When you, a um, little practice tip here. If you can get them to poop before you do this, that's great. Because when you give it, it's like any enema. It does make them feel like they have to poop. So I always make sure we take them out before they get into the owner's car. <laughs> because that's, uh, that's an unpleasant tree. It's just, think about it as if it was a cat that you just gave an enema to or a dog. So it's gonna cause some feeling of fullness and they're gonna wanna defecate. We hold the tail down for a couple of minutes after we finish uh, um, pushing the syringe. We push fairly slowly, you know, maybe over a couple minutes because you don't wanna make a big balloon all at once. That stretch could be uncomfortable um, and, uh, much more likely to make them defecate right then. So a couple of tips on that, but that, like we discussed with uh, the blood flow to the paddock portal vein, um, that is one of the easiest ways to get it systemically. Another cool thing about rectal insufflation is that if you have clients or if you have your own pets, I'm sure some of you have train wrecks that you love like I do um, at my house, then you can use this at home it's not easy to do hemotherapy um, at home. That, that's, uh, that shouldn't be done. But your clients can buy small machines that they can use at home if you get things started. Uh, then that's a way that they can support their animals at home, or you can with your own pets by doing the rectal. Um, here's This syringe just has gas in it. Sometimes, like I said, I prefer that around tumors, and sometimes I will mix it with blood. Dose matters, we're gonna talk about that in the third lecture. If you're using it at, the, at too high a dose, it stings. Why would it sting, anybody got an idea? What does it make it? What does ozone, what is one of the components it's, it generates in the body that would bubble and sting? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so we have to be careful about that, but it's kind of crazy cool when you're injecting around certain lesions and you can see it just bubble under the skin, especially on these old kitties or a really uh, decrepit chihuahua. You can see because their skin is thin. Um, ozonated fluids, you can, um, like I said, you can inject the gas right into the port for kitty cats, for sub-Q. If you go by the booth, you'll see that there's a big glass um, container that is, uh, that has a charcoal, um, there's, there's an intake and an outflow. You don't want that ozone gas escaping into your clinic. 
because you don't want to breathe it. So it's already got a charcoal filter to break that down. But you can ozonate huge volumes of saline and then bubble it periodically throughout the day to flush wounds, to give IV. Uh, it looks like you shouldn't do it, but remember, everything is sterilized, so it's perfectly fine to do it that way. But that way, we've got a big supply that we can use throughout the day. Mix, you know, bubble it that way and then put it in our dental machine, for instance. Yeah? Uh, after it's mixed and everything, does it have, have an expiration date of uh, must be used within a certain time? <laughs> yeah, so once you mix ozone, she's asking uh, in fluids, does it have an expiration date? Yes. When we mix fluids, it's good for about 30 minutes. That's it. Then you've got to bubble it again. If you freeze it, you can use it for about three days. So when I get to some of these other cases, when I want to send ozone fluids with people, uh, when I, it's more stable the colder it is. The warmer it is, the more it just dissipates into gas. That makes sense, right? The more we warm up liquids, they turn into gas. Uh, here's that limb bag that we talked about earlier on the first slide. So there are special bags that you can get um, as, an, as a complement to the machine where there's, a, uh, there's two ports, one for the ozone to go in and one for the ozone to come out, and then it can connect back to your ozone generator. We'll always have another little, another little port on it that's called the destruct. That will take the ozone, and if there's any left in, in the gas, um, then it will convert it back to oxygen as a safety mechanism because we don't want to breathe it. Uh, the other thing you can do is um, if you don't have the special bag or if you're doing the whole critter like we talked about, um, then you take them outside and squeeze the bag off the body, and then the gas is released outside. That works too. Yeah. Yep. It breaks down latex. You can't use ozone with any kind of latex. Uh, red rubber catheters, it destroys them. <laughs> you have to use silicone. You can use, uh, uh, there are special catheters that we use from, um, from O3 vets when we're doing our rectal, but you can also use Tomcat catheters. You can use IV catheters, like sometimes I'll flush wounds. If I want to get into a bite wound and I'm probing around that pocket, I'll use uh, like an 18 gauge. That works too. Um, Somebody was asking at the booth yesterday if you can use it with, with exotics. You can. You can use it uh, um, with cows. They're using, there's a big study that uh, showed um, being able to give the gas directly into mammary glands in cows that have drug-resistant mastitis. So able to cure that when other drugs were not working. Um, this is kind of cute. <laughs> so you can actually put the gas directly into the ears using a stethoscope, but it can't have the black latex tubing. So you can, you can get the, the silicone tubing to connect right to that, and it goes in the ear. But you have to sit there and hold it. So we usually just use the ozone saline. But that is another way to get gas directly to the surface. One thing I forgot to mention with the limb bagging, Ozone gas does not get through the skin very well unless it's wet. So you have to give them um, a bath if you're doing the whole body first, and then, uh, and then ozone bag. Or if it's a leg, you want to get that leg wet so that the gas can permeate through the skin. Same thing with the ears. Anything you're flushing, if it's not already wet, um, if it's one of those dry, waxy, nasty ears, you, that's another benefit of using the epiotic or, or some surfactant to break that stuff down first and then come behind it with your ozone. Um, there are topical creams and salves, so ozone can be impregnated into oils and stabilized, so you can send stuff home like that. So I usually send home these tubs of ozonated olive oil or ozonated sunflower oil is even stronger, so it stings a little bit more. Um, and I will um, use it anywhere I would use Panalog. So hot spots, things like that. Okay, 
we are going to, this is, um, this also pertains to the, the next lecture. The last lecture I'm going to do is, are, is about how you can combine treatments. But like I was saying earlier, uh, I saw Frenchie Friday, Thursday or Friday, that uh, went to ER, thought it was back pain, thought it was a foreign body because he was, you know, acting like his abdomen. It's very difficult sometimes to discern abdominal pain from back pain, right? Um, they took x-rays and uh, did not see an obstructive pattern, sent him home with um, pain meds and gave him serenia. And he was worse by that morning, like could barely, barely get around. His back's all roached up. Um, can't lay down, just, he's just in a lot of pain. It, actually, even his sclera were injected. His eyes were bloodshot because of the pain. Uh, and I localized it to the TL area. Um, on the x-rays that they took at ER, there was no evidence of that. There was no calcification. There was no narrowing of the disc space, which sometimes happens. Um, and he, uh, so it wasn't obvious on presentation where that was coming from. but. When I localized it, we gave him butorphanol and dex. Remember, I tell you, I'm not, I'm not just doing holistic. I'm, I'm using all my tools. But then when I come back and hit these trigger points, um, I'm using ozone in those points. And you can see it puff up. And within about, I mean, the Torb obviously is going to make him feel better, but he was sleeping. He felt so much better. He finally laid down. I put a rolled up towel under his chin. Another thing that's important if you're treating a disc in a neck or a back, if you can get that chin up, it helps keep that spine elevated and they can rest more quickly. And also at home too, if they can keep the head up a little bit, it, it makes that spine a little more neutral. Just a little practice thing there. Uh, um, also, anybody familiar with protein-rich plasma or stem cells? Yeah, do you have a book? Yes. <laughs> Um, so, anybody heard of prolotherapy? This is kind of out there, but again, being used on the human side for people with cruciate tears. So think doggies. Um, when you inject, uh, prolotherapy is a whole nother lecture, but basically what you're doing is trying to stimulate blood flow to the ligaments to get them to repair. You're not going to restabilize a torn cranial cruciate ligament. But what you're trying to do is stabilize the rest of the, the um, joint capsule and uh, get that, get that uh, pain and inflammation down. It's terrific for the other knee before it goes, so something to keep in mind with that. But when you mix ozone with this, it just potentiates all of that. Just like we said earlier, it's like a pro-drug. So it will potentiate the use of um, that prolotherapy or platelet-rich plasma or stem cells, whatever you're using to try and help that joint because it's, it's activating um, that antioxidant cascade. It's encouraging the immune system to come in and clean up inflammation, all of those benefits with that. So there's... Um, a stifle, looks like a rotty probably, because they, they do get a lot of that. And uh, um, you can mix it, mix the, the ozone in with the, with the plasma and then give it that way. Sometimes you can just, just give the straight gas. That's usually what I do. We're not using um, PRP or stem cells at this point in our practice. We're just using the gas in those areas. So indications, there's my Zoe. <laughs> um, she would just fuss at herself. You know how dogs will do that, just nee, 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 nee. And then she would chew her tail, never any fleas. Sometimes she'd get little collarettes on her flanks and um, break out on her belly. And I, uh, I bathed her. But I didn't want to start steroids or, or atopica or cytopoint yet. It wasn't terrible, but it was annoying. And um, I decided to try that minor autohemotherapy because I had seen it at one of the other uh, ozone seminars that I was learning from. So I tried it. Mixed some of her blood with some ozone. I had the setting at like 
25 or 30 micrograms, which was a lot, and she screamed when I gave her the shot. <laughs> so most of the local injections, I do at, the, at a lower concentration of about 16 micrograms per milliliter. So if it's anywhere on the outside of the body, I'm doing 16. If it's inside, like for IV or rectal, I'm going 35 to 55. We'll talk about that more in the third lecture, okay? How to, do how to dose. Um, but I did that maybe once a month, usually whenever the staff would be like, Doc's always chewing herself again, because <laughs> they mostly hung out in Amy's office. Um, and uh, after about the third treatment, she stopped completely and never had a relapse. It's it been over a year and no, no medications. One thing I would say about any treatment is if you're starting sooner before it becomes really chronic and you got the leathery skin and all that, obviously it's going to work more efficiently, right? Um, but it's still a tremendous adjunct with these really chronic, difficult cases that we have too. But it's going to take more than what I did for Zoe. I would say probably once a week for a month at least. Yes? So I also have a dog that is like this. Yeah. I actually, each year it's kind of gotten worse. Yeah. So I've been doing like keto sea wipes or like putting her cone on her and whatnot. And she's never had like an actual active infection like between her toes, but it's like it's always been yeasty. So I actually just gave like this past week. I gave and I gave it. Right. Um, in a case, like if so, if there was like an actual bacterial infection, we do do. Um, medications to treat in conjunction with ozone? Is that something that you would uh, You could, for sure. So she's asking, you know, what, would, what can you do for like a pododermatitis? Would you use medications and ozone? You can. Um, you might find, though, that if you just did um, like an ozone wash on the feet and then did the injection, um, that you could get it under control and then not have to rely on it. And also, like you're saying with that pattern, so allergies seem to either get better year by year, and this is people too, or they get less. So if you're amping up, you're probably looking out over years of needing more and more intervention. And if you can re, you know, reduce that inflammation and get the immune system more on an even keel, then it's not gonna react so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, pancreatitis. So dogs and cats that have recurring pancreatitis, it's inflammation triggered. Um, I have actually used the gas right into the abdomen, but rectal is a very safe, easy way to give it initially. And you can also, if they're really sick, if they have to be hospitalized, if you can't just treat it outpatient with uh, like ozonated sub-Q fluids <clears throat> and rectal ozone and your serenia and, and pain relief, all the things that we need to do, right? Um, then I would do the major. I would draw blood, mix it with ozone, and give it intravenously for chronic or, or severe pancreatitis. Um, ears again. Remember, we got to get rid of all that dry, waxy material or it's not going to get good contact. And I like to give IV steroids if it's a bad ear like that and wait about half an hour before I start because I need that canal to, sh to uh, decrease in swelling so that I can actually get down in that ear. Yes? Uh, would you go like super low steroids or something like that? Actually? I do, uh, no, it depends on how bad or how painful that ear is, but sometimes uh, when I'm using dexamethasone is what I'm talking about, I'll do 0.5 milligrams per kilogram and give it IV. Um, when it's a, a hot, painful ear like that. Um, here's a slide of a terrible, terrible urine scald. You know, some, some old critters that are in diapers and people aren't changing them often enough. If you look at that first slide, I can barely see her vulva. <laughs> it's, so, it's so raw. Um, we had a dog that was going for her second TPLO and um, the surgeon would not cut her because she had um, pyoderma in her groin. And, they, and it was drug resistant. <laughs> this poor woman has been through Hershey is who I'm talking about. Sweet, sweet thing. Super fat originally. I got her to lose, get, get mom on board to lose weight, but we still didn't save the second knee. This is before I knew how to do the prolotherapy. But um, they wouldn't take her to surgery because of this resistant bacterial infection on her belly. 
they wanted her to use bleach, you know, the bleach solution. Nothing wrong with that, but it's it's bleach. <laughs> um, so she wanted to know if there was anything we could do. We put her. We have one of those big um, foamy V troughs. So we'd lay her in there. I think we have pictures of her too. It's hilarious. She would lay on her back, and we would uh, just lavage that whole area with ozonated saline. Do a little chlorhex first, and then ozonated saline, and it went away. Uh, where the antibiotics were not treating it per their culture. Oh, I want to say she came like twice a week for two weeks in order to get that under control. So then she could have her surgery. Um, critical care cases. When an animal comes into me these days, if they are looking pathetic like this, if they're uh, frail and weak, we know we can get oxygen into the bloodstream right away. I also do it when dogs come in with a cardiac emergency. They get rectal insufflation also because, again, we're getting, we're getting more oxygen into the bloodstream um, that's portable. If you don't have an O2 cage, if, you, uh, if the dog is not going to let you put oxygen on its face, that's, those are also good helps, right? But if we can get it actually into the body um, directly through the rectal, that helps a lot. If I have a dog um, on the table and it's crashing or it comes in with a, a low SpO2, we'll give um, rectal ozone also to get that SpO2 back up. And um, trying to think of some other ones. Basically, every old cat that looks like death warmed over. <laughs> But we do honey first on the gums, like I was saying in the first lecture for folks that are just joining us. Um, that is really the only side effect other than you don't want to breathe it because it's very irritating to the lungs. Uh, for old frail kitties or, and even old dogs, if we have like, like um, we, have, uh, we had one um, other patient that came in that really should have been euthanized and I tried to talk her into it, but she just, some people are not ready to go not ready to let them go. So we did try ozone, and I didn't think it would work, and it didn't. It doesn't work for everything. There's nothing that's going to work for everything. We all have an expiration date. But um, when, um, when we use it for very frail patients like that rot or the old kitties, we do put honey on the gums. Otherwise, they can feel, um, they can become hypoglycemic and get very weak immediately following your treatment. Uh, I love it for corneal ulcers because you're oxygenating the tissue. I still have to send people to Optho for a diamond burr. <laughs> it happens. But I can send home vials of frozen um, uh, ozonated saline, and they thaw it out each day and swish it on the eye. And that can help. You can also, there are also little cups that come with um, as another accessory, so you can put the gas right on the eye too with the cup. But again, you want to be careful that that doesn't get outside. You sure can. Yeah. Good idea. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Do you have a book? Yes. <laughs> so for those who maybe didn't hear it and for the recording, uh, she asked if you could ozonate serum for eye, autologous serum drops for eyes. And that's a great idea. I love it. Um, hot spots. We would treat with a, a flush first ozone flush, and then we put, send them home with the ozonated. I would probably do olive oil on this one because it's a lower concentration of ozone. The sunflower one would probably sting that one. Uh, electrical burn on a tongue. Um, it's great to lavage the mouth with that. You can send home um, the frozen. They can thaw it out and keep using it every day. But you're getting oxygen back to that tissue. You're making sure it doesn't get infected, uh, and then um, helping it repair. Here is the chicken video. This, um, this was also one of Dr. Um, Siegel's um, cases. And I don't know if you can see, because the lights might blur it, but this chicken is covered in maggots. There we go. So they gave it into the cloaca. They did. Uh, rectal insufflation, but in the cloaca, cleaned that whole area and then lavaged it with ozonated saline, and she laid an egg later that day. <laughs> oh 
and all that redness went away. I wish, you guys, that I had thought about um, um, taking a picture of this cat's butt. You know how some of these fat kitties can't clean their tush? And they come in with this terrible diaper rash, just on fire. So one kitty came in for a sanitary clip as a tech appointment. And Miranda came and got me and she said, Doc, you got to look at this tush. And I was like, oh my gosh, let's put some ozone on it. <laughs> so we ozonated some saline. And as I'm spraying it on her butt, it goes from red to pale pink, just like that. I've tried it on other cats and it didn't work. <laughs> but that cat, it was like night and day. I still use it, even though I don't always get that dramatic improvement, but it was fantastic. And then we send them home with the ozone as a butt cream also. Which one would you use? Olive oil or sunflower oil? Which one? Olive oil. Yes, because why? Doesn't sting. Yay. <laughs> All right, let's skip that one. Um, this was a, a dog that came in for a resistant, this is not my case, but this dog was paralyzed and Dr. Siegel diagnosed um, a drug resistant pseudomonas in the bladder. What else is going on here? Anybody see it? This is an osteosarcoma. She treated both with ozone, and the dog had six more months of comfort um, by injecting ozone around. The osteosarc, you have to be very careful you don't hit that bone because it just crumbles, right? That's how they fracture so easily. Um, and she got major autohemotherapy because this is a big problem, right? But also catheterized the bladder, lavaged the bladder with um, ozonated saline. In Brazil, apparently, they're leaving those catheters in and they're lavaging multiple times a day for cases like this for like two or three days in a row. So that's uh, one of the things that I'm starting to learn is like how often do I have to use it? And sometimes you have to seek that information from colleagues that have been doing it longer. So that's how they handled this case. Um, you guys have all seen these mouths. Terrifying. You can smell the picture. <laughs> so just to bring home the point, um, like I said, dentists are in love with ozone. For this reason, I'm sure people mouths look like that. Ugh, I can't even imagine. But um, we see it all the time. And when, when after you get all that crap chipped off and uh, take your x-rays and you know what teeth have to go, you come back and ozonate the whole thing. Or, like I said, you can put distilled water. Actually, you get the highest concentration of ozone is in distilled water because there's no other salts or anything else to grab it up. So it's more available in distilled water, which is perfect for your dental machine. Um, but you wouldn't want to use that sub-Q, but you can use it in the mouth. What's the danger of you inhaling it when you're scaling? Once it's ozonated uh, into a fluid, it doesn't, it doesn't cause a problem. We haven't had a problem with it. If you have asthma, though, I wouldn't recommend it. I think that's, I think that's testing the waters too much. Um, Anne, who is our, as, our asthma uh, coworker, um, she can't even smell the ozonated oil. She's that reactive. But this poor woman, you know, she's on all the inhalers and everything, so she's got a really serious case of it. But the rest of us are fine. Um, it just would be, be aware that that could be different depending on the person's lung health. Yeah? So with this, um, I know we said that you could run it through the olive oil and that would make it safe to be around. The to breathe in. in. Yes. So in a case, because a lot of the times we see dogs like this and they are anesthetic risk nightmares. Right. They're horrible, they're decrepit, they have heart murmurs, they're in renal failure. Right. Could you almost do like kind of a band-aid thing with this and run it through an oxygen mask <coughs> and like do a treatment on the mouth to try to help you could, but I would, I would, um, I would do ozonated uh, water, first. water first. Yeah, I would just do oral rinses. The other thing I do for a case just like you're talking about, like I said, I use all my tools. Um, it's not great, but it's important to think about the dog's quality of life. I will do pulse antibiotics. Anybody doing that? Yeah. Uh, so five days each month. I tell people if we start on the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, every single month, those same days they get clindamycin. So we do five days a month 
of clindamycin. And that will really knock down that infection and give them pain relief. It's, it, it's not addressing the underlying problem, and I tell them. I said, this is like a festering splinter, bunches of them in their mouth. But sometimes financially or because of other comorbidities, you can't do it. I understand that. Uh, this was a nasal carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, that was treated uh, with nebulized ozone through the olive oil. And I'm guessing she probably also used major autohemotherapy. I use it, if it's a cancer patient, I'm always gonna use the major because we need as much of that immune system stimulated and on board as possible. Um, here's another one, a dog with disc disease that was dragging herself around the person's home. And then they did the ozonated um, acupuncture and she was up and walking within, I think, three days. Also another case where they couldn't ref re could not refer. So you've seen this, very sad. And then they, I guess, got a haircut and everything. <laughs> You can still see some ataxia in the back end. It's still a little base wide, but much better. Uh, and then again, just to reiterate, um, ozone therapy, if, you apply, if, you, if it's applied following some simple rules like dosing, but also don't directly contact lung tissue, has very few uh, uh, contraindications. There have been a few people who have died from using ozone. They gave the gas directly to themselves IV. That is not to be done. Uh, it works well in horses if you know what you're doing. Uh, I, I only know that because other veterinarians know that. I don't do that because I don't do horses, but you might. So it can be used IV because the, the jugular vein is huge, as we know, um, and it does disperse the ozone before it can cause any um, reaction to the lung. It gets circulated well. We already talked about this in the first lecture. Um, if you've got, so kind of first and third, same. Um, if you have DIC, you don't want to use it. Um, and it, uh, some people are cautious about it if you've got a ruptured uh, bleeding organ. <coughs> this is my kitty Fergie. Uh, no, this is not Fergie, this is Marvel, oh my gosh. Um, Fergie's another story, but uh, Marvel is she's seven years old now, spayed female. She was my mom's kitty, and when she moved into the nursing home, I got her. Um, one morning, Marv did not come down to eat, and Marvel is like a Labrador in a cat body. She loves her meals. So I f I'm looking all over the house, and I finally find her under a bookcase, all hunched over, eyes are draining, she's sneezing. I took her temp, she's 105'4". So I'm sure I was a fomite and I brought home a cootie from work and she got a viral upper respiratory is what I'm thinking. Um, she did not want to eat and she was just wiped out. Makes sense with that fever, right? Um, I didn't have any, uh, normally I have a nice little pharmacy in my basement, <laughs> but my fluids were, I went to get my bag of fluids because I don't have to use it very often. I'm like, ah, I don't think I should use that. But I did have my little handy dandy ozone briefcase. So I made her a rectal ozone, 20 mLs. Um, when, I'm, when I'm going rectally because it's internal, I'll go 35, like I said, up to 55. So I gave her 35 and that was all I had. I went, I put her in my, lawn, in my uh, master bathroom with a litter box, food and water, and a little Betty bye, and I said, I'll, I'll see you when I get home, because she also hates to be in the car, so I didn't want to drag her to work. I came home in the afternoon, the same day, I took her, she's like, yum, 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 and she'd eaten all her food, and she pooped and peed in the litter box. The poop was partially diarrhea, because of what I said about the ozone. It can stimulate um, a, a BM like that, um, just like any other enema. She ate all that food, and she never looked back. I didn't have to even repeat the ozone. Again, I think because I caught it right when the virus got started. If this had been going on a few days, I would imagine I would have had to do several uh, days in a row of rectal ozone, but she didn't get antibiotics or fluids or anything, and she was perfectly back to normal. Here's my Frank. Um, 
Frank has two moms. She thinks Amy's her work mom and I'm her home mom. <laughs> but she uh, came to me um, at four months of age. She had been uh, adopted at eight weeks old by a wonderful vet tech that I know who's Fear Free certified. Uh, Frankie developed a fever at nine weeks of age, 105 for seven days. And her joint swelled. They ran all the tests. It was probably HOD, uh, which is an inflammatory condition. We don't always know what triggers it. They threw a ton of antibiotics at her. Uh, she was on all kinds of pain meds. Had to be carried outside to go to the bathroom. She couldn't even walk. So that, I'm sure, was a traumatic event, plus COVID. Um, uh, my friend has two young kids, and Frankie started going after the kids. She's a nervous personality, but also, I think, with that history of being painful and toddlers. You know, so she took her to, a, so she started biting at the kids, and the behavioralist put her on this cocktail, clonidine, GABA, and fluoxetine. So she was kind of a little zombie puppy when I got her, and I don't have toddlers anymore. My girls are all grown up, so she did great at my house. Plus, Chaz was her her mentor, and he really helped her become, my, my sweet old dog, helped her become a much more stable citizen. So I was able to get her off everything. At that time, um, I was still doing relief work. One of the jobs I had, I'd had her like six months, and so I was, I was heading up to a job in Lapeer from Ann Arbor, so it's a long drive. And we ended up going through construction, and I think all the trucks and everything that were around freaked her out. When we left home that night, she was back and forth, back and forth in the back seat of the car, salivating, and then she took the biggest dump in my back seat <laughs> while we're on 23 going south. I thought I had made a mistake, and I just didn't give her enough time to poop before we left work. But it happened every day, every day, every drive for two weeks. I put her back on gabapentin, I added trazodone, because you know the fluoxetine's not gonna work that fast. Um, I could not keep this dog. It terrified her to be in the car. So I was gonna have to rehome her. Um, what I ended up doing for her is also gonna be discussed in more detail in our third lecture, uh, but I gave her a microbiome transplant. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Not you. Okay. Um, we affectionately call it a poop smoothie at our hospital. <coughs> Why would I think of doing that for this dog? The only reason is I had been looking up information for a friend of mine who had been diagnosed with celiac disease. And uh, you may know that the FDA has approved fecal transplants for people with C. diff and celiac disease. As I was reading about celiac disease and how can she find a donor, you know, because this is a terrible, terrible disease. Um, there were other reports there that are not FDA approved yet in kids for depression and anxiety. And I thought, what have I got to lose? I had some, I, so I remember I told you, you saw the first slide the first hour, some of you, all the things I tried for Chaz to save him and make his life better. One of the things I did was a microbiome transplant because if you've got a healthy gut biome, everything works better. Most of our immune system's there, right? Um, so I had one left over, one jar of frozen poop in my deep freezer, bleh. <laughs> and I thought it out and gave it to Frank one day after, after work, because it was literally like, you're going on the Humane Society page after this as a home adoption. Um, and I used the ozone first because I need to make sure that that rectum, that colon is sterile, right? Because we know it kills pathogens. Um, got rid of the old guys, came in with the new, with that, that frozen sample, thawed out. And the next day, the first thing I noticed is that she always had a little bit of green discharge in her eyes from her allergies. I just wiped the goop out. That was gone. We got in the car. I'm very nervous about how this is going to go. And she was perfect and she's been perfect in the car ever since. 
She's still a cuckoo. She still barks at our oxygen guy every time he comes in. She does not like men. Uh, we were doing construction next door to our hospital because we're building a new facility, and she barks at all those guys. Um, she's still a neurotic COVID puppy, but she's okay in the car. <laughs> Um, so that changed her behavior, which was shocking to me. But again, you know, you just start digging around trying to figure out solutions, and sometimes you find things that help other, other problems. So after her poop smoothie, this is to Frank. She stole a cat bed. <laughs> she's chill. She's happy. Um, and like I said, she's maintained her normal behavior on car rides ever since. So um, just kind of recap. This is a nice slide that kind of shows you different categories of what you could use the different ozone forms in different cases. So uh, vomiting, diarrhea, um, like that HG, HGE, sorry, I'm out of time. But uh, if you guys have extra questions about this slide, uh, please come see me at the break. And we will talk more about these um, applications and how you can integrate it with some of the things you're doing at, at your clinic already in the third lecture. Thank you.